On today's Coaching Coordinator Podcast, we begin our adjustment series. On Mondays, each week throughout the season, after a weekend of watching football, I'll discuss some adjustments on offense, defense, and special teams, as well as a discussion of adding wrinkles. And we'll discuss how all of these changes can be implemented in practice. Today, we're going to focus on the theme of adding stressors. So a few seasons ago, I was talking with a coach on my podcast about in-season adjustments, and he made a great point that any changes during the season should be micro-adjustments. Those would be things like an adjustment versus a certain front on offense, a variation in alignment on defense, a refinement of technique, etc. The macro changes are those big changes, and those should be saved for the offseason. Things like changing an offensive system or installing a completely new coverage take a lot of time, and you want the offseason to be able to get ready for those things. So our focus is going to be on the micro changes in this series. Those are the things that can give you an edge to stay ahead of your competition. So first, let's focus on the offense. And I watched several games this weekend from multiple levels. And the first stressor that I can think of uh, to work in an offense's favor, especially in the early weeks of the season, comes in the area of procedures, including tempo. This time of the year, typically it's hot. Usually it's the first time for starters getting a full game under their belts. And being able to operate a fast tempo certainly can stress a defense at this point in the season. But not all teams are up-tempo. I still like a non-know-huddle offense to have some procedural tools that allow them to move fast. And I saw that from a team this weekend that used one-word calls to perfection, even though they typically huddled as their base procedure. And they did this at optimal times. So after a big play, when the defense was scrambling to get the ball on short yardage situation, (coughs) (coughs) they did this at optimal times. Like after a big play when the defense was scrambling to get back to the ball, to the line of scrimmage. On short yardage plays, uh, situations where the defense in this particular game was looking to get big personnel into the game and was already in the process of subbing, and they had to call a timeout twice because of this. We'll discuss this a little bit later. And then also they used it on the goal line to score a touchdown. The offense clearly had a small set of plays ready for this game in their game plan that you could tell they practiced those they're ready to execute those and that became an advantage for them Uh, the defense that was used to having some time to catch their breath and get a call in between plays was left scrambling in these situations and in a base call and having to line up in a base call so how do you install and practice these well if these are plays you're going to utilize throughout the season then I'd be sure to script those into every team period. The situational understanding is important. So if it's a play that you're going to use after a big play, then think about how you can put that into your team period uh, where there's a gain and you need to get everybody uh, hustled to the ball and aligned for that next play following that or that one-word call that you put in. Uh, You want to let the coach or the manager spotting the ball uh, to, to, again, spot the ball immediately, Uh, Let them know it's a big gain, first down, and get them into the procedure for the one-word call, right? Doing these in isolation doesn't give you that practice of having them implemented in a game, you know, suddenly. So that's what you want to emphasize and work on there. Think about this if it's a situational play like that third or fourth and short. uh, You want to be utilizing those situations and get those chains out, right? I think it's important if you if you can do it, if you have the people to do it, get your chains out in practice and give it that situational awareness or at the very least, give every play context by having someone call out the down and distance. So again, in this situation, the offense would get up to the ball as fast as possible after hearing that one word call and execute the play. The next thing I saw in an adjustment or uh, something I would use to to stress a defense, especially here in the early season, was something with formations. There was a team that uh, used multiple shifts and motions on most play, and I love that idea. I love being able to use multiple movements, etc. But what I didn't like is they, they were a huddle team as well, 
and they just took a lot of time to get aligned. Some of their formations I thought were very unique and definitely would require adjustments by a defense. It's stuff that you don't normally line up to, but because they were walking out of the huddle, because their shifts were more of a jog, sometimes even a walk, rather than you know hustling over to the other side in that new alignment, it really didn't stress the offense. So I want to see some better tempo out of the huddle. I'd suggest a team like that use a sugar huddle and get close to the ball and break out of it quickly, then start their movements. Those shifts done very slowly don't really do anything to stress the defense much. We would always talk to our guys about we want this to be at a run pace, not a sprint, right? But at a run pace, you are hustling over to the other side, but it's not a jog or a walk. You want to stress the defense if you're doing these things. Some of the most successful teams in the NFL, you think about it like the, the 49ers a couple years ago, uh, the, 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 uh, the Rams, right? Those guys use movement on almost every play. I think the year that San Francisco was in the Super Bowl, they, I think the stat was like 73% of the time they were moving. They, they led the NFL in that. They like it because it stresses the defense. They have you know, a lot to do there. They've, they need to recognize, communicate, and adjust. And I've said it before on the podcast, recognize, communicate, adjust. That's three opportunities to be wrong. I know a lot of up-tempo teams have explored the idea of adding shifts and motions into their offense. And I believe there's a simple way to do that by tapping into your lettering system that you use to label your players. So, Let's take an example here of a double move or a shift in a motion. Uh, You could move both players at the same time in a shift and get set, or you could shift first and then the second one after to go in motion. Again, using the the lettering system, I might think about doing this as uh, just putting both of those letters into the call. So uh, the format, you give the formation, um, and then give those players letters. Let's say it's uh, Z and Y that you're moving, or Y and then Z. So, you know, signal and Y and Z. And they just know from that formation, you know, they're going to get to the opposite side into uh, the position that they are aligned in. Now, the tight end will do it first and get set. Then the Z would go in motion second and go to the other side. So just a simple idea of how you implement it. I think there's plenty of ways. I'm not going to get into a discussion that here, but uh, that's a way to do it. So why would you do the, the two movements though? Why do it that way instead of moving two guys? Well, again, I'm thinking about that forcing that communication. So now two times in that particular play, in that particular alignment, they have to communicate, uh, recognize, communicate, and adjust. Again, three times, three chances to be wrong, right? Force more on them. You want to add that stressor. So what made me think of this, though, I saw a team utilizing a tight end trade. That's all they did in the game. Uh, They didn't use motion. They had only a couple formations. And, you know, I do like the tight end trade against teams that like to align to strength, right? When you see that defensive personnel that has a strong side and a weak side in in the run part of the formation, at least, or front, you can trade and then get your tight end on that guy who they like to have on the open side, right? That's an effective trade, right? The defense they were facing was either a field or boundary team or right and left. And those those guys really didn't it didn't bother them. They knew they'd have to play those situations. You could tell they probably have worked that being able to play on the open side and over a tight end. Uh, their tackles, right, would play both, a one or a three. And so all they would do is kick the front when that tight end moved. It was very easy trade for them to adjust to maybe early in the game it it, you know that movement causes a little bit more stress but I think as the game wore on it really didn't have much effectiveness to do it so uh, you want to see them have something a little bit more difficult to adjust to Um, what would have stressed them more again was was trading that run strength and then motioning across and changing the pass strength because this particular team utilized just two formations in the game. They were in a pro eye and then they were in a twins eye. And I I love the eye formation. It's good to see some of that under center stuff making a comeback. I I like what you can do out of it. But uh, again, there wasn't much stress to the defense, right? So just again, thinking in a a strategy of this, 
Uh, the handful of plays that they used I thought was good, but again, that very vanilla attack, and I thought by the end of the game, the defense was really catching up to them. Um, so I would think about it this way. I would move those multiple movements, right? Move that tight end across, move the other guy to the twins. Have multiple ways to do it. Uh, use the shift only. Use the shift in emotion. Sometimes use the motion and mix those things up, forcing them to communicate, right? You don't want to get them... Uh, let them just sit back and, and play against vanilla. So uh, that's one way to do it. The other thing I, I think I would do, and it's something we did in the past when we were a pro I team years ago, was uh, you know even though we would run our fullback sometimes, we'd like to move that guy around, right? We'd like to put him in a wing off of the tight end or uh, in that wing position to the open side off of the tackle, uh, create more gaps, still have him doing the same things he normally would, in the blocking scheme, but now you have that extra player near the line of scrimmage that you need to account for in passing strength a little bit more than that guy who's in the backfield. And, uh, you know, the one thing I saw is they're trying to get an outside zone play going, and I think they could have been a little bit more effective in spreading the defensive front out, right? If you're running in that I formation, you're adding a gap on the move. You still have that guy. You can insert him in different places which I think is a good thing, but I think mixing it up with, again, adding that extra gap now makes them spread out a little bit, and especially if you're running something like the outside zone, uh, gives you some opportunity there. But I think it works well with gap schemes too. So they wouldn't have to do anything really different to their game plan, but now they can use that guy, use him in multiple places. And again, this is something you want to work in practice, right? You want to get your guys familiar with different alignments, uh, movements, etc. Uh, So let's take that shift in motion. Let's take those extra alignments. And in a five or 10 minute period, uh, operating out of a huddle, you still could get a ton of reps here, right? Uh, Linemen don't need to be involved in this. In fact, I wouldn't. I think it's a waste of their time. Send them off. Let them work on their schemes. Let them work on some individual technique. But take your guys, take cans, uh, cones, a line strip to simulate that offensive line and allow these guys to come out of the huddle, get into their uh, different shifts and motions, right? Give them those calls, get their alignments, and get a lot of reps in. And the other thing I like about that, if you're doing it against those those cans, those strips, you can get two or three, depending on how many groups you have of guys doing this drill at the same time, and again, get a ton of those reps. The emphasis there is, is going to be moving fast. Get out of the huddle. Get out of the huddle fast. Get that shift fast and really stress the defense. Uh, make sure that all uh, of your motions are legal. There were two procedure penalties in, in one of the games I watched. The guy turned up too soon, right? You want to get used to the timing of those, and I think it needs reps. So you might get your team reps where you do some of those things, but I think setting it aside, especially early season, having that one to two periods a week where you work on this will prove effective. Um, from a coach perspective, because we can get better too. We can make adjustments as well. I think the one thing I saw that a lot of teams could do better uh, early on here in the season is getting their information in, really understanding what they need to, to look at. I saw a lot of squandered opportunities because either there was a flaw in their communication or a flaw in what everybody was watching up there. And, and if you're not specific about what you want coaches to watch, the tendency is to become a fan. Give everybody a job. Tell them what you want them to chart on every single play. Tell them what they should be looking at and go over that procedure to communicate it. Sometimes, again, I think we get too uh, intricate in how we're trying to identify things as well. So sometimes it's better to go bigger picture. Where is space? Yeah, you're going to want to know was it an even front, an odd front. Uh, You're going to want to know the rotation of coverages, etc. Those are important, but more than anything, where's the space in the defense and are you attacking it? And I think maybe you have a guy just big picture looking for those things because as an example, I'm sitting there in the stands at this game and just thinking, God, if these guys throw a corner route right now, it's a touchdown based on the alignment of what I was seeing there from the defense. So again, we don't want to overcomplicate it for ourselves. We only have seconds to think about this, to get the information to who needs to know it, and we don't want to outsmart ourselves. And if if you're a new staff or you have members who are new, I do think this takes some time to get used to. So in terms of practice, get those headphones out. 
Get used to communicating. Uh, even though you may be scripting, right? Have everyone go through their communication procedures on every single play. Noel Mazzoni joined us on the podcast one time, and, and he will be with us weekly for an in-season uh, series starting next week. But he mentioned to us on the podcast that he didn't script anything, that he completely went off the situation. He would script the situations that he wanted, and then he would work getting his calls in from what he had planned for that particular week. Uh, likewise, I saw that with Mike Leach. I was able to attend a Mississippi State uh, practice last year, and he was just calling based on the situation, right? He did not have a script. He did have someone charting those. That was something Noel mentioned as well, that they would chart those and look back at them and make sure they were getting those reps that they needed. So if they didn't get reps on a particular day, they could cover it the next, etc. So the main thing, though, that Uh, Noel emphasizes that as coaches, we need the reps as well, right? So don't take that for granted because there's only limited time for us to get better at what we do. And then the last thing on the offensive side of the ball, uh, the thing I would have liked to see more is a gadget play. So I saw one, and it was actually the Browns uh, against the Giants. And the, the announcers said that they had talked to Kevin Stefanski obviously before the game, and he told them to expect one in the game because that's what they do. And if you watch the Browns every single game, they do have some kind of gadget. So this was a, you know, a shift, a motion, and then a reverse, and they were able to get a first down on that play. Uh, so, you know, I, th- I think you want to think about how can I implement some of those plays every single week, but uh, it does take practice. So from an implementation point, I'd install these a few weeks ahead of when you expect to use them in order to get some of that work and always have your skill players practicing the skills that they need to do on those particular plays. So for example, if you have a receiver who's going to be that double pass guy, make sure he's getting some work, uh, pre-practice and individual, you know, post-practice, whatever it might be, get him reps on catching that first pass and throwing that second pass. Have him work on that skill week to week. Maybe you use him again later in a different look, but Now he's your guy. He's your double pass guy. Your reverse guys. Get those guys in practice exchanging the ball. Is it going to be a handoff? Is it going to be a dead pitch? Which I recommend. Uh, Again, pre-practice, individual. Where is that worked? Those things, those exchanges, those the ball handling aspects of those trick plays sometimes are more important than just running it in team. That those guys need to get the reps. And when you think about it, you're only going to get it a few reps in practice even if you've been working it for weeks, but you want to work the critical ball handling aspects throughout the season. Let's move on to the defense. And I have a couple here in terms of, again, preparation and removing stress from your defense. And the first thing I thought of is the idea of getting your best 11 on the field. Depth charts are great. And in the course of any single game, a second teamer will most likely play. But what do you do in case of that injury? You lose a guy uh, for more than a a series. You lose a guy for a game, the next game, a few weeks. How does that next most dynamic defender get on the field if one of your starters goes down? What tools do you have? Or how does your structure accommodate that change? For example, let's say there's an injury to your starting end and the most dynamic guy is an undersized outside linebacker. He clearly gives you more than that next end. Do you have something structurally that allows him to get on the field? What do you do to make some of those micro changes, like I mentioned before? Not overhauling your defense now because that guy's down, but accounting for it within your structure. And again, something that made me think of this is, is uh, that, that uh, one of the games I'm watching, they had multiple outside linebackers, right? I saw guys alternating in there. They both were pretty good. You could tell that either they were still in a battle for who's the starter or it was decided they were going to split time. Uh, but then their defensive end went down. Now, he, he only went down for uh, the rest of that series. He had cramps or something, I think, on the sideline in his leg. Uh, but if this were the case where that guy was off the field and he was one of their best defenders, how do you get that next best guy in? Because I'm watching the guy who's coming in and he clearly just in watching him run onto the field, athletically was a drop-off from that player before. Yet I still had that guy, right, that they felt good enough to be alternating series with the starter. Or again, you know, maybe it wasn't determined who was better yet. How do we get that guy on the field? 
how how can we adapt? So it made me think of something I heard from uh, Jeff Dittman at RPI, right? And he would use uh, four down uh, or three down adjustment to his four down defense, right? So you, you have to think about how you're going to work those in practice. You need to think about preparing for all contingencies. Now, sometimes the, the next guy in is, is the guy on the depth chart, right? But if a player comes off and you have another dynamic player on the field, how do you get him involved? Maybe it's a safety who either comes in as an outside linebacker or you find a way to use your coverages to get that guy down in the box more. Um, you know, I gave the example with the defensive lineman, but who are those key guys? If we lose this guy, here's our contingency plan. And that might not be the next guy on the depth chart. That might be some adjustments to, to uh, the stru- you know, not structurally, but to some of the things you're doing to get, get you into something else there, right? These packages that you're putting together, those can, can add to a stress of the offense. Don't be afraid to work them in the course of a game, right? Maybe you use it as a changeup. So if you were that four down, you leave that outside linebacker and maybe not get that most dynamic end off the field, but uh, sub in for the other guy and, and give him something to look at. Get it on film because, you know, we're going to practice against it, right? But you're going to get better as well. So look at that odd front. And use movement to get back into your even front gap responsibilities, right? Lots of way to do it. It's not, you know, we're not going to get in the weeds about that here, but the point is to think about those things, right? Uh, movement is another thing. I saw that, uh, you know, something always uh, we would have to concern ourselves with, practice against every single week. But I, I know this, especially again, early season, movement done wrong can open up some huge gaps, huge running lanes, uh, especially versus certain schemes. Most young defensive players need to be able to work on staying in that gap, even when the gaps are moving, like take an outside zone scheme, right? He has a gap responsibility, and that movement sometimes, I've seen this often, could remove him by two gaps because he's not adjusting on the run. And that's something you need to work with those guys. How do you do it in practice? Well, I think part of the issue is that many walkthroughs for the defense are done on cans or against cones, right? Guys are movement moving to a static point, right? It's not a moving pro- point where you have schemes and offensive linemen moving. You have that on every single play. You want to be sure you're working moving gaps and work the technique to hold that gap responsibility and come off and make a tackle. So, Adding extra contact doesn't have to be the answer. We could still handle this in a walkthrough using five or six guys with shields uh, who would look at a scheme card, get that scheme, take that shield, and they're just moving in that blocking scheme. You have that soft pad there. You're not having contact, but your guy is looking to, you know, what's that stimulus that he's seeing that forces him to adjust, right? Think about how you can do that week to week. Work those schemes that you're going to see especially if you're a movement team, because again, done wrong can get you in a lot of trouble. The other issue I see is working the engaged tackle. Are you working enough in those kinds of situations with your defensive line? Uh, The engaged tackle, the primary focus is with the interior line and those box players that you want to create leverage in short spaces. So the engaged tackle that occurs more than half the time for the interior defenders. I think it could be up to 70% of the time that they're engaged with a blocker having to make a tackle. Linebackers, that's about 30% of the time when he's engaged with a blocker and making a tackle. And it's something learned from Coach Digitano at Fordham, right? So he likes to work it. And the key points that he gives on that is, number one, you want that defensive lineman or that engaged blocker to hold the ground. They want to lean into or what he calls wedge into the blocker, right? Uh, They want to be in the gap. They want to get hands on and throw that vertical punch and and bring that hip, throw that hip along with it too. Then you go to that, he calls it a one-arm tear. You go to that one-arm tackle and then bring that second one into the tackle. But you see that all the time where guys are engaged and they have to start to initiate that that movement into him to be able to come off and get that one arm around and get that other arm in the clamp. And if you look at that, I'll share uh, in the show notes, uh, the, the sugar huddle, what I call chaos. I'll have a video on that. Um, 
uh, a video from Coach Dittman on adjustments to his three down front. And I also put something in there on the engaged uh, engaged tackle here, uh, the one arm tear from Coach Dig. So be sure to check that out at coachandcoordinator.com. Uh, that obviously won't be in the app show notes, so get over to coachingcoordinator.com to see that. The thing I had mentioned earlier was a team getting caught in a substitution in a short yarded situation. And again, this one's more on the coaches. This is something to prepare for in terms of your communication as well as how to play that situation with your team on the field, right? So I know if if I'm looking at a team and I see they're subbing, I might see the advantage to keep whatever personnel I have out there and go fast, which is exactly what happened in this particular game. And you want to make sure that your guys are working that situation. So if you have your, your regular defense on the field, they're short yardage, how are they going to play it? What's their call, especially when they're going fast, right? You don't want to necessarily be in a vanilla call on a short yardage situation. So preparing them for that situation. They're caught out on the field in a substitution change and work that in practice. Almost like I said, working the offense, right? Do the flip, have your scout team run up to the ball. Make sure, again, you're giving them context. What's the down and distance? And your guys know, okay, one word call. They got up to the ball quick. Here's our answer to this, and we're prepared and we're running it. The other suggestion, again, is more on the coaching side is to have eyes on the sideline at all times. So even if you're not a big match personnel team, situationally, though, you're still going to want to look at that. It still helps the coach to know, you know, they're bringing extra tight ends into the game and having him think about his the defensive coordinator thinking about that call. So have someone assigned to that in the box, you know, letting, letting you know what personnel is coming onto this field as well as the up-tempo play. Because I'm sitting there in the stands and I see it. Here they go, they're up-tempo yet the defense is subbing in, right? So if you have that communication and that initiates everything first before a change is made, uh, you're going to be in a better situation. Work on some simple code words. The one thing I've seen defenses do a lot better is they've started to use some of that offensive terminology and procedures. So they get into one-word calls as well. Finally, let's look at some special teams. And I saw two things I think that we could address here in this first week. And the first was on kickoff. So in this particular kickoff in this game, there was a guy there, number 79, in what I would call the tight end position. So second line on the end. And uh, the team that was kicking off did a really nice job. I saw they were working a hand signal system. And from what I could see and watching them throughout the game, uh, they were signaling where the ball was going to go as well as what the coverage was going to be, right? And they probably had a couple coverages, and it's important to know where the ball's going so those guys could adjust. So he caught it right away. He saw number 79 on the field. He did not look like the most athletic guy. And sure enough, the ball was pooched right to that guy. He immediately became a target just because of that number he was was wearing. So uh, they did end up recovering it, but you could tell he was not easy in getting that ball, uh, ended up making the catch. But I do think it's a smart move to try to try to do those things. Look for those guys on tape as you go through the season. And they probably didn't have tape on these guys, at least with, uh, you know, game numbers on. But if you see those non-skilled players with that ineligible number, right, that should be a bullseye and something for you to think about to, to pooch kick to that guy, to sky kick it to him, make him handle the ball. Uh, if you are that guy who wants, or that team that wants to use that guy, then you better be sure he can handle those situations. So when I think about it, we only get so much time for those kickoffs. So just like I would work with my guys on some of those trick plays who would need some extra work on the ball handling, I might take that guy, especially if he's a backup, and send him over to the kicker for a five-minute period every week to just work on kick, kick, kicking those pooch kicks to him, right? The kicker's getting some work and he's getting those reps catching it. You could do that with all your players on your return team, right? Take a guy over there when he wants to work on the onside kicks. Get that frontline guy used to getting that ball off the ground and covering it up. So again, easily can be done. Find that time, steal that time, and practice. The second stressor opportunity that I thought was missed was by a team whose quarterback is the punter. And 
philosophically, they may believe in that formation that they use, which was double tight with a three-man shield. So that might be what they want to do. Protect them first. Let's get that punt off, etc. But I do believe they could give a defense more to prepare for if that QB is presented as a threat to run an offensive play. I would especially do this midfield going in, right? Might, might not be as believable and a waste of time. I've seen teams do it on their own 10 and, you know, they're not going to buy it, et cetera. But as you get closer to midfield or beyond midfield, I think this is a good opportunity maybe to spread them out and provide an opportunity for that quarterback to throw the ball, run the ball, et cetera. So again, maybe that guy's convicted about that formation. Fine. Get into it to punt, but get everybody in a spread first. Look for the opportunity. Look for a signal from the sideline, et cetera. Shift into that tight punt. Now, the defense is going to have to adjust to it, right? They're going to probably bring – they won't have a returner back immediately. They're going to have him there, and he's going to have to get back. He's not going to have a lot of time to get set and maybe go through his normal routine, something you want. A little bit more stress for the defense. Um, Again, You don't have to do this all the time, but think about those areas of the field where you might do it. And again, from a a practice standpoint, I would uh, handle that by giving those offensive plays that you put. Again, I put a small package in there. Get those reps probably in a a separate walkthrough, a five-minute period. Um, Maybe get one in during your team reps, but you really use your team reps to work on that punt. That part's important. But over the course of the season, you'll find that these reps, uh, you know, you'll have that cumulative effect of those reps that guys will get better at what you're trying to do. So that's it for this week. Uh, Think about what you can do that's simple for you, but provides a stress to the opponent. And we're going to have more of these uh, every week throughout the season. Again, go to the show notes and check for all these ideas. There's a a video on a lot of these in the show notes at coachandcoordinator.com. Also, follow me on Twitter at Coach K. Grabowski.